Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's TP Talks webinar. If there's one thing we know for certain is that this pandemic has necessitated many changes in our lives, personally and professionally. Tomorrow will not be the same as yesterday. So what does this new normal look like? I'm your moderator, Amit Shankadas, with Teleperformance, and I'm responsible to help align teleperformance solutions to market needs. I'm joined today by an esteemed panelist group, Melissa O'Brien with HFS Research, Michael DeSalds with Frost & Sullivan, and Stephen Lloyd with Trendouts. Before we get started, real quick, a couple of housekeeping items. There are several related resources for you to download in the resources widget to the right of your screen. Please do so whenever you uh, join this webinar. This webinar is designed to be interactive. You'll see multiple icons at the bottom of your console. If you have questions, we'd love to, for you to interact with us. Submit your questions in the Q&A window. Do so anytime during the conversation, and we'll take them as we go through this webinar and then certainly at the end. Should you have any technical issues, click on the Help widget. And if you'd like to reach out to us, do click on the email widget at the bottom. A little bit about TP Talks. TP Talks is a series of 30-minute bite-sized webinar segments designed to help you as curators of your customer experience. This is to help you learn from best practices, big trends, innovations, and real-world success stories from people just like yourself. Teleperformance, your host today. We are an agile business service partner that helps companies in the digital transformation process. Teleperformance manages billions of transactions every year and serves as a strategic partner to some of the world's leading brands by providing digitally integrated business services. We offer a one office support service model combining customer experience management, back office services, and knowledge services. Through our vast platform, you can see the numbers here and the size and scale, combining with high-tech, high-touch, Lean Six Sigma discipline, we help make each interaction simpler, faster, safer, and more cost-effective. We're particularly proud of awards we win and recognition we get from industry bodies such as Great Place to Work, and also in various leadership quadrants and awards from industry analysts. We're also proud of the recognition we get from our clients in making a palpable difference to their environments. With that behind us, I would love to introduce our panelists today. With us from a city where happy hours are against the law, Boston, Massachusetts, Melissa O'Brien, Research Vice President with HFS Research. That is sadly true. Yes, uh, hi everyone, Melissa O'Brien. Thanks for having me on it. We are looking forward to uh, maybe sharing happy hours, if not in the city, maybe elsewhere, um, post-COVID, obviously. Um, secondly, Michael DeSalis with Frost and Sullivan, I think from his own office, maybe close to, I don't think in the Alamo. Is that right, Michael? San Antonio, <laughs> Texas? Is. That is correct, Amit. Uh, greetings from the Alamo City. I'm delighted to be with you all today. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Michael. And certainly, last but not the least, Stephen Loins, who launched Trend Owls recently um, and spent several years as an analyst in the CX space, joins us from Washington, D.C. I learned today a city that gets more rain than Seattle. Thank you, Amit. It's great to be here. It's, it, it's funny. Uh, today it's actually raining, so that's a fitting intro, <laughs> and I look forward to today's session. Excellent. Let's get started with that. Let's get right to, right to it. So uh, let's go through this briefly because we, we know that uh, the pandemic has caused uh, a quick move to business continuity plans, and would, I'm curious from your perspective as you speak to lots of different brands globally, uh, help us understand from your perspective how COVID has impacted our industry and individual businesses. And Melissa, maybe we'll kick off with you first, please. Sure. Yeah, happy to. Uh, 
um, you know, the impact I think has been has been really vast and 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 deep. But I think we've got some some lessons learned coming from that. You know, we're still very much learning. We're in that in, in that state. But um, you know, really, I've been so impressed with the, the speed with which uh, companies have mobilized and pivoted to work from home. And in particular, as we talk about the CX space, uh, it's quite remarkable for organizations, particularly large organizations like yourselves, that have had the the capability to to swiftly move and 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 mobilize and and get folks set up and it's been it's been quite encouraging and and also quite remarkable um so yeah i think you know first lesson learned is just about how how great that the teams and the partnerships have been i think you know longer term what we will start to to see is is an exposure of some of the the difficulties not of, of just work from home but of our processes there you know, broken processes, difficulties in, in customer service management that perhaps don't come to light when you're not in an environment like this that's stressed under so much volume and so much disruption and, and difference in, in the environment where we're working. So um, I think that this is a, a time to be looking at our, our inefficient workflows, and this is really the burning platform to take a hard look at how we can redesign things moving forward to um, you know, to, to make things more efficient and, and even better uh, as we see the light at the end of the tunnel. So, and I'll, I'll pass over to Steve to comment on that next. Thank you, Melissa. And I, I love the word that you use there, mobilization. Uh, and Amit, to, to turn to your question, um, I think that the big thing that sticks out for me is how many BPOs have had to mobilize, as as Melissa just uh, discussed briefly, and how well most of them are doing it. Now, within that, in the short time I have, it occurred to me the biggest theme for me or idea that I've been thinking about is I, if we stand back and we think about society and the economy in general, um, you know, what we're seeing out there because of COVID-19 is this question around, um, it's really a test for gov governments um, from citizens, you know, uh, and the most important thing that governments can do is, is to overcome any sort of trust deficit that there might be as they um, try to lead people through this crisis. It's very much um, uh, per perhaps going forward a redefining of the social contract, if you will. So now think about BPO in the context of this, right? Um, we may, and what I think we're seeing in real time is this test of BPO providers, a, a BPO diplomacy, if you will. How well are they protecting their employees and their jobs? Um, what types of systems of social protection, if you will, are being put in place? This is a huge test. Um, I was pleased to see in your uh, release uh, this week, guys, from Teleperformance, that the uh, European Works Council, for example, had very good things to say uh, as representatives of 22 countries on w what Teleperformance, how they are grappling with this crisis. And this is really important, and, and I want to continue to discuss this um, uh, uh, over time. And I've been writing about it and thinking about it and blogging about it. And uh, I'll end uh, my final point here is that just yesterday, we saw protesters here in Washington, D.C., a rainy Washington, painting in front of Jeff Bezos' house at Amazon, protesting the conditions there. And so um, uh, uh, is there a trust deficit? And how is it being addressed? How is that social contract and worker contract uh, being addressed. That's the big theme for me. And with that, I want to uh, hand it over to Michael DeSales for some of his thoughts as well. Thanks uh, very much, Steve. I, I echo your notion of, of um, maybe lack of trust. But what I've learned is that not only BPO companies, but enterprises across the globe really do care and are passionate about their employees, about their employees' well-being. You know, they want to reassure people around the globe that if they do have to come to work, they've got a safe place to come to work each day. And, you know, it's about communications, about preventative health practices, following recommendations from the World Health Organization, and, and more. 
One thing that I'm seeing that makes me smile is there is kind of a new level of cooperation between competing BPOs. A lot of the CEOs know each other, and so I think they're sharing not only learnings, but also opportunities to improve the business and finding ways, especially with the movement for um, remote agents, how to do that in a way that makes sense for the employees, makes sense for customers, and still can provide that customer experience we've been looking for. So again, a priority to care for employees, care for customers, and proactively reaching out and proposing plans of action. I, I think that you know disaster recovery, business continuity planning, um, you find out if it works or not, and you continue to refine the, the plans you have in place. Uh, the last thing that I've learned is <clears throat> that this wider adoption um, will happen with automation, probably more self-service options, including online community forums, perhaps virtual assistants, and, uh, of course, chatbots. So, Mitt, I'll turn it back to you. Well, Michael, that's actually a perfect segue to our next topic. They say necessity is the mother of invention. And unfortunately, the pandemic has necessitated a lot of fast movement, the mobilization that, uh, Melissa, you alluded to, you know, a, a change in terms of the social contract or the cooperation, Michael, that you alluded to. But let's get to kind of the crux of this, I think, and, and that is at some point of time, we know, um, we know we will come out of this, right? And, and while COVID is a catalyst to digitization, by the way, the same can be said for, for Waha, there's more to it for what this new normal will look like. So, Michael, let's continue with that thought. And what do you think, as we come out of this, because we will, what do you think does the, next norm, does the new normal look like? What's your vision of the new normal? <laughs> It, that's a great question, Amit. So I think we're living in it right now. I think that companies that have made the conversion to work at home, even reluctantly, are finding out it actually works and that there, yeah, there are going to be bugs, there are going to be challenges, but they've worked them out because we're looking for two things, for folks to be safe and for them to be productive. So clearly, you know, Zoom is probably the, um, you know, video conferencing uh, 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 deployment, you know, of choice, frankly. But there are a lot of other tools that folks can use. I think that with the uncertainty, unpredictability that comes with this, we're living with this day by day. And I think that companies are spending most of their time with their heads down on business continuity planning, but thinking about the next six months. What's this going to mean to the organization in terms of how things are laid out, what the org chart looks like, who's working from home, who's not, and, and how it can benefit the business in the long run. Melissa, actually, you know, Michael, I want to come back to you on the BCP piece sure. because obviously, um, you know, we've, we've had to mobilize, everybody has had to mobilize from a BCP mm. perspective. How do you look at BCP in the new normal? So here's what I've seen, you know, this notion of proactive outreach, as I mentioned before, to employees and clients, and telling them exactly what you're going to do. If there's a preventive measure, like taking temperatures in contact centers where, <clears throat> excuse me, employees are still working, that's important. Um, status surveys, having provisions on site. Uh, for example, ample drinking water, face masks, disinfectants. I, I learned recently Teleperformance has a stock of 6 million masks for its contact center employees that are in, um, in sites. That, that's significant. Um, antibacterial sprays everywhere, frankly. The, the other piece that includes, you know, elevating cleaning and sanitizing procedures at delivery sites, and that's just not domestic. That's near shore and offshore pretty much everywhere. And then last, this whole transition, which has been huge, moving entire lines of business, even entire accounts to a work-at-home agent model. And that includes a lot. It's not just moving the agent and the equipment. There's the recruiting, the hiring, the training, the onboarding, all the normal things that would happen in a contact center environment. And then finally, I think it's going to be about real-time monitoring of global situations, be it a pandemic, a political situation, the like. And, you know, having the executive teams make this kind of monitoring and readout a real priority to review and take immediate action if necessary 
to restore critical business functions to some level of normalcy. Great. Thanks for that insight there, Michael. You bet. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that insight. Um, Melissa, HSS has had an interesting take on one office and digital transformation in particular. So um, share with the audience, if you will, your vision of the new normal, particularly as it relates to the one office and, and digital transformation platforms. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think everyone's trying to figure out what this the, the new normal looks like and nobody quite knows, right? But we've had this sort of framework that we've been working with at HFS and uh, that we've been promoting and evangelizing called the one office that you mentioned. So if I could indulge in that kind of slightly idealized version, we can talk about some of the practical elements, but the one office concept, you know, with the with, with time frame in mind, in short, it's really about aligning an entire organization to customer experience. And we have evolved that um, that model to now include employee experience and really any any stakeholder experience. So how are folks getting information, connecting processes, using intelligent digital technology to support it? But that, that's, that's sort of what we've been talking about moving toward. And I, I truly believe that smart companies that have made the right investments or are making, making the right decisions now can come out of this stronger from an experience standpoint. And what that means for CX is really kind of a redesign and, and an assessment of the processes that, that support um, customer experience and the people that are on the front lines of customer experience. So finding that right balance. Of course, right now, first and foremost, it's about taking care of employees. What does that look like down the line as, as centers start to open here and there, or you know, perhaps they open and then you have to take folks back due to different waves. I think the, the point here is around looking at this digital transformation that everyone's been talking about, now we actually have the opportunity to take a step back and see, you know, what what does the channel mix look like? What is uh you know, how can we use intelligent bots and AI? And and all of these are different levers that you can pull on, including work from home and including just geographical diversity, right? So it's all a piece of it. Um and finding that right balance that truly supports the customer experience, the employee experience. So that's my my optimistic vision, and I actually think it's it's quite attainable if companies take a take a good hard look right now at what's going well and and what's going wrong. Optimism is definitely the need of the hour, Melissa. Uh, <laughs> Steve, when we talked, you were of, of the opinion that the new normal will bring about some systemic changes. How so? Yes, Amit. Uh, to riff off of what Melissa just said, I agree that there is this quickening, if you will, toward a digital shore, a shoreline with digitization and the use of uh, voice bots and chat bots uh, with AI that are at the same time changing our expectations as consumers for ease and, and a high level of experience. So I agree with all that and I've written about it. But I'd also like to be a little bit counterintuitive and I, I do think there's an irony at the heart of what we're talking about here. And I mentioned this at your teleperformance um, facility in one of them in, in India in January. And, and that irony is this, um, it, as tech uh, really has ambushed us and, and increases in speed, this uh, immersive techno consumerism, if you will, mm -hmm. um, to, to echo what the earlier sentiments that I expressed, I do think that there may be some pushback, some throttling back on that, if you will, because of this idea of the social contract and um, uh, a pro-worker agenda. So imagine, if you will, a new normal, and none of us know exactly what the future will be, but I was, I was brainstorming about this, thinking about it. What if in a place like the United States of all places, um, there's a bit of an anti-globalization agenda that begins to gain momentum, that begins to take shape. Uh, how, how might that affect our industry and the BPO industry, a, pr a more pro-worker agenda, if you will, um, progressive policy proposals, sort of a neo-Hamiltonian uh, political economy, if you will, because of the pressure that people exert on the government. And I mentioned a, a protest that we had here last night um, in front of Jeff Bezos' house. And so what, you know, 
for example, think about if, if there was a decision ultimately to tax labor arbitrage on U.S. firms. I'm not saying that's going to take place, but these are the things we have to start thinking about. We've talked about uh, the possibility that robots could be taxed um, in, in prior discussions. So for me, when I think of um, pro- possible scenarios of the future and a new normal, uh, that cartoon that you put up a slide or two ago, I'd actually think about changing it um, where they're sitting around the table and they're saying to each other, you know, um, there was an assumption. There is an assumption that is true that digitization is taking place. We all know it for sure. And here comes COVID-19 to remind us sitting around the table that people are at the heart, not only of this industry, but they're out there in the society right now wrestling with this thing. And so uh, we need to remember that. And I'm really interested to see how this evolves the situation and how it's going to impact economies and the BPO industry specifically when it comes to not only digitization, but the people at the heart of what we do. You know, um, Steve, it's it's interesting you say that because we kind of look at it as business resiliency from a high tech and a high touch perspective and finding the balance between the touch being the people aspect of it and, and the tech being the digitization aspect of it. Um, quick reminder to everybody, please submit questions uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, we will have a chance to address some of these questions towards the end of this, uh, of this webinar. So let's talk about the path to new normal. We will get back, we, as we've discussed, is kind of a vision for what this might look like. But let's get a little more brass tracks and, and talk about what can organizations do now to start thinking about and preparing about the new for the new normal and and Steve I'll just kind of stick with you as you went through this piece and and maybe from a from your perspective if you look at this from a global sourcing perspective where do you see this mm-hmm. going what do companies well, do well I I think the, the 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 first point I think of is as I as I read through your release from this week on your first quarter results the first thing that uh, smart providers global providers need to be doing is having that conversation with their employees. In this example, it is through the European Works Council, as I understood it. But, um, you know, the European model, if you will, uh, we've talked about uh, how Europe uh, is probably going to influence the United States and the world as far as GDPR and issues of privacy. Well, imagine, too, if, uh, if, if a more uh, pro-worker agenda starts to materialize, uh, in a place like the United States and in other localities, then the European example of uh, uh, European works councils might gain influence. I don't know. So um, I think it's important for providers, for enterprises to be having great communication and conversations with their employees uh, about the situation. And to your point, Amit, also, you know, that leads to other conversations. How will technology mesh with human beings going forward to augment their performance and to improve the performance of the enterprise? And to uh, Melissa's earlier point about improving the customer and employee experience at the enterprise. Um, So that's the big thing is the communications with employees going forward and how that might take place. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Stephen. Michael, from your from your perspective, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, the need for security, privacy, etc. Particularly as you talk about elements like GDPR mm-hmm. or data, and you know, as, as in your view, for what can organizations do to prepare? Uh, give us your perspective. Well, sure. I think um, probably the first thing that comes to mind as we talk about the work at home model is the reticence or you know, queasiness on the part of some clients to not like that model because they're concerned about security. You know, the question is, is the agent who they say they are? Are there opportunities for fraud? And so I think right now um, there has been, so to speak, an easing of those concerns, frankly, as we need people working from home, again, productively. So the security doesn't end right there. There's also the security, for example, in contact centers themselves for employees, for vendors, for anyone outside of the organization, again, to be healthy and to maintain an environment um, where people feel as if they can come to work again very safely. 
I think the security concerns that we've always had about cyber threats, about um, phishing, um, social media, those, those will continue, frankly. I think the attackers will continue to get smarter, use new tools and the like, which keeps, you know, information security uh, and security specialists, you know, up at night, thinking about where are the threats coming from and doing a really good job these days, in terms of what I'm seeing, is, is proactively looking for the threats and understanding how to mitigate them and how to learn from that and share it across uh, standards globally. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Melissa, your take on the role of CX design and digital transformation as we move forward. Yeah, I mean, I think I really liked Michael's comments, and, and you went kind of deep, Mike, on the, uh, on the security aspect, but you mentioned that, you know, keeping people safe and healthy and work from home and where we don't know when centers will reopen, how they will reopen, if we have to take steps back and close again. I think one of the biggest things companies need to be thinking about right now is how to optimize those platforms and optimize the communication tools. Communication and transparency are the biggest things when it comes to this, this paradigm when it deals with employee engagement. And we have to recognize the fact that while a lot of companies, CPOs like yourselves, have been really mature in having this, you know, work at home offer as part of a, you know, delivery uh, portfolio offering, the, the center folks that you had within, you know, the brick and mortar facilities aren't the same profiles and they aren't working on the same type of things. It's a fundamental different kind of design. And so while the last few weeks have been tremendous and just kind of getting everybody moved that you could and, and hunkered down and, and settled in with the technology and with the with business process, we also have to be aware of the fact that these folks, you know, may not necessarily take to work from home. Right now, everybody seems to be rallying. I've heard great stories about, you know, even better um, performances and productivity and stuff because people, you know, are grateful to have a job and, and want the security and stability. Longer term, depending on what the next normal looks like and, and having more and more folks work from home, I think it's super important that we look at the tools that we have and how we engage employees. So thinking about the virtual collaboration tools, the training, the career pathing, even just something as simple as, you know, having the, the, the daily, the three times a day huddles, you know, that these folks don't have. And, and I, I spent a lot of time working in the Philippines. I know how important it was for those Starbucks runs that you got to take. So, you know, are we setting up virtual water coolers and things like that for, for people to, to feel, um, you know, it's a, a mental well-being as, as well as just being able to be productive. So I, I think if, if I had to say, you know, what we need to double down on right now in terms of preparing for the future, it's that element of, of how we how we approach this this work at home, um, these work at home folks and how we engage. I thank you, Melissa. I think we have time for a question. Uh, for those questions we haven't been able to address, we will address them individually. And uh, Michael, I, I might put this one at you. Uh, the question is, what are your thoughts on companies with captive or single locations? Will they look for partners um, or expand on their own? Great question. Um, my opinion is I think they should, and, and this should certainly be a planning consideration for the future. For most companies, you know, contact center work is not their core competency. For service providers, it is, and they're set up for it. They've already done the heavy lifting for recruiting, hiring, onboarding, and supervisory management. Th those are some of the reasons why, and that, that has nothing to do with cost per se. Also, service providers have the experience now of dealing with this pandemic and are very adept at putting work at home model in play on a very large scale. So I, I think they, they should consider it if they're not already, and if they're already outsourcing, they should expand it, frankly. Back to you, Amit. Great, thank you. Thank you, Michael. With that, we come to the conclusion of today's TP Talks. I want to remind everybody that an on-demand version of the webcast will be available in about a day's time. You can use the same link to access it or share it with others in your organization. Uh, also a reminder that we have, as you'll see in the resources section there, we have a roundtable coming up that dwells deeper into the topic around automation in the new normal. If you haven't already registered, 
click on the link and you should be able to register right away. Um, with that, Melissa, Michael, Steve, thank you so much for your participation in today's TP Talks. Thank you so much for your insight. Um, definitely a lot of food for thought. This is a confusing, challenging time for all. Your clarity, your providing insight into how we can get some clarity to this is much appreciated. Have a great day. Stay safe. The three of you and to the audience, stay safe. Thank you, everybody.